what ministry was then, the gig I signed up for, and the gig that it is right. today <laughs> bear zero resemblance yeah. <laughs> on the most part to each other. How pastoral leadership and the expectation of clergy has changed and grown over those years. These are extraordinary times, but the good news is we are loved by an extraordinary God. It will be that extraordinary love that will carry us through anything we face. Welcome to times like these. In this podcast, you will hear stories of lives changed and experiences shared with the people of the United Methodist Church here in West Ohio and around the world. Our guests today are Wade and Alex Giffen. Wade is the senior pastor at Trinity United Methodist Church. His son Alex is a layperson serving in full-time ministry at Church of the Messiah. Listen in as they talk about life as a pastor's kid and similarities and differences of living out their individual calls to ministry. When did you receive the call to ministry? So I had a sense of a call to ministry when I was about 17 years old. We were members at Shiloh United Methodist Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. We had this really, really cool associate pastor. His name was Kelly Silvers. Kelly took a special interest in the young adults and uh, the older teenagers of the church and just our own faith journeys and spiritual journeys. And I was lucky to be one of those kids that was hanging around with him. And I remember that there was a moment that I really began to just admire him. I remember I used to watch him in ministry and in worship and in a variety of places and go, golly, I wonder if, I wonder if I could do that. Maybe, maybe that's what I'm doing. Now, I had no context whatsoever to be able to, to put it in language like, I wonder if I'm experiencing a call to ministry, you know, those kind of things. So that, I think, is when it really started. Then it kind of went, it went dormant for a number of years. I was always aware, but kind of dormant as I really was wrestling in a time in my life around whether that was really something I wanted to do or not. And then, you know, eventually at around 24, um, that call became really clear. And then I began to think about full-time ministry. And one of the things I think that shifted is I began to think about it not as if I could do something like that. And it became more around, I wonder if I would be able to get to do something like that. So, Alex, I'm going to ask you a question. As your dad, you grew up as the infamous PK and uh, you were, um, in many ways, a stereotypic PK. You knew all the nooks and crannies of every church and every place that we've been and navigated that. But um, I bet you there were some challenges as a part of that, some difficulties. Uh, what, was, uh, what was one of your greatest challenges? I think for me, one of the, one of the challenges was um, realizing that there were many times that I had to share my dad with a community of people and not just the community that he interacted with but on a on a much greater level on a you know a, a religious leader a, a, an emotional level of connection and sharing that that required you to be a part of uh, of people's lives and to help care uh, for their own um, spiritual formation and faith journey so i think that was that was unique because uh you know growing up there were a lot of times that it was dad's got to work late because he has a staff parish meeting or he has whatever meeting it might be. And because you work in a church and the church members and people who are involved in that community work their own day jobs, the meetings that take place would oftentimes have to happen later in the evening, after dinner time or during the dinner hour, things like that, because that's just that's how it worked, right? And so, you know, I think looking back, you know, there were times that it was like, oh, I wish, I wish I could hang out with dad or I need help with this, with this homework assignment or whatever it might have been. There were lots of times that it was, no, dad, dad has this, this thing going on at church that, that we've got to do. So I think, you know, I think looking back, it's in maybe in, to help lend perspective to individuals who who haven't grown up in kind of the home of a clergy person or in, in lots of cases to clergy people. And I think, you know, it's just realizing the amount of emotional presence and physical presence that being a pastor requires. Let's talk a little bit more about you being uh, being a pastor's kid. <clears throat> Tell me, even after some of the things that were a little bit of a challenge, 
What were the things you were most excited about? What you loved yeah. the most about? A couple things come to mind. Uh, I think the one is is the um, level of emotional intelligence that you learn at a very young age yeah. Yeah. is so it was so incredible because I think you know back then we didn't really call it emotional intelligence, right? We would just just say, oh well, they're really akin to that person's feelings and what they're going through, and and you know because we are a family of the leader of the church, you know, so I was exposed to a really young age the healthy ways to get through the difficultness of life. I remember when you walked with families who lost babies to young people dying in car accidents to um, individuals with cancer to any number of things, and not just death, but I think that's an example of those really vulnerable times in people's lives and learning how to interact with those people in a loving and caring way while not ignoring the pain that's going on. Because I think a lot of things that society naturally feels that we should do is well, that difficult thing's going on in your life. I'm going to avoid yeah, we'll bringing it up else. at all costs, yeah. right? And so for my upbringing and learning, it was to bring it up in a way that honors the situation and honors the pain and the memory and the love of whatever that person might be going through. So that's one. I think the other thing is, is that PKs really get the opportunity to see the good of the church in a different way that a lot of people don't, right? And so uh, I know that you and mom made a really conscious effort to make sure that Chris and I, uh, Chris is my brother for those who are listening, but Chris and I were exposed to the missional field at a very young age, um, which a lot of families do, and, and to give credit to that, but you know, we had the opportunity because that was part of dad's work to be involved in. And so to go out into the mission field, both locally and internationally, and to know what life is like for others was really, really special. And to know that the church is doing good work, the church wants to be in the lives of of the disenfranchised and those um, who live on the margins. So on the flip side, uh, talking about my challenges and joys, what has been maybe one of or, or some of your greatest challenges uh, being in, in full-time ministry? Yeah, you know, um I said before, you know, ministry is something I get to do, and it is it is joyful, and that really dominates uh, the years that that I've been in ministry. But there, you know, we do say ministry is hard; it's not easy, and there are challenges along the way. And it's really hard for me to really think about, you know, what was the greatest challenge. Um, um, but there are there are some things that kind of I think have have been more present than some of the other things that are challenging. And I think one of the things that's been really obvious to me over the years is, you know, I'm in the 34th year uh, since I quit my job and took off to seminary and decided I was going to be in ministry. What ministry was then, the gig I signed up for and the gig that it is today (laughs) bear zero resemblance (laughs) on the most part to each other, how pastoral leadership and the expectation of clergy has changed and grown over those years. And so the challenge of that is pastoral leaders, clergy have to continuously be reinventing themselves and their leadership and learning and growing um, and lifelong uh, lifelong learning so that we can actually do that. You know, I was with somebody not too long ago and said, yeah, you guys kind of went from like, preaching on Sunday and being the pastoral presence in people's lives and around the community to CEOs of, you know, one and a half and two million dollar businesses. And, you know, it's kind of a shocking thing to hear, but in many ways, that's that's very, very true. And that's been one of the challenges. I think the other thing for me that has just been, pre- just has pervaded all my years of ministry is how slow change happens. Mm-hmm. When, you know, I feel very clear that God has given a vision to a congregation for who God needs that congregation to be in that time and in that place and um, just how slowly it takes to get to that place to affect that change. So I think those are a couple of the couple of the things um, that's happened. I mean, you want me to talk about some joys while I'm yeah, kind of there? Absolutely. So, you know, ministry is a thrill. And you were talking, Alex, a little bit about the the privileges that you have experienced, you know, as the son of a clergy person and some of the things that you've been able to do. And I think privilege is really maybe maybe the the place I'd want to say that I 
I get opportunities to be in person's lives in some of the most intimate, difficult, joyous, I mean, you just name it, moments of their lives. And to be invited in and know that you are welcome and your presence and your word is a welcome part of that is is just an absolute, absolute joy. Even in those hard times when you went up, you know, a mom or a grandma or a grandpa or somebody is passing and you get to be there. That's a privilege. You know, I've been in some places long enough that, that um, you know, I get to marry a couple and then I get to baptize their babies. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just, just that kind of stuff is an absolute joy. The other thing that I would say probably was the, was the kind of predominant joy as I look back over my life is, you know, we are in the business of helping people come to know and follow Jesus. And the countless times that I have seen lives changed and lives transformed because of anything I had the privilege to do that they may have decided, you know, I want to follow, I want to follow Jesus. And not just that moment for them, but then to watch them then begin to lead other people yeah. in the same way. And that's that's been um, that's been one of the joys and what what it's all about. What do you appreciate and love about the United Methodist Church? The connectionalism of the United Methodist Church that I have seen in all corners of the globe is probably one of the things that I just appreciate the most. Maybe one of the ways to illustrate that most clearly is like UMCOR, you know, United Methodist Committee on yeah. Relief. You know, why is UMCOR always able to be at every disaster or every situation first? first. Because we have the best delivery system in the world, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Methodist, United Methodist Church on every corner, and we work as a connected church to do that. You know, I was really, really fortunate to be able to do some work in our um, uh in our partnership in Vietnam and in Thailand, some of that that work there. And it's, it's just amazing that even across those cultures, the connection that United Methodists share when they're with, um, with each other. And I believe that that connectionalism gives us superpower sometimes and some strength to be able um, to do that. There are other things about the United Methodist Church that I'm really, really proud of, of what our history has made happen. You know, I think things about how we believe that education is is really important and um uh, you know the the numbers of colleges and universities that exist today because um you know our methodist grandpas and grandmas were the ones who were making that happen um you know we have some of some of those universities right here in columbus ohio i think about things like how there's always been an emphasis around well-being and health, mm-hmm. um, being a whole person, you know, being well, mind, body, spirit, you know, um, relationships, that being whole persons and the health systems that have emerged because of, you know, because of, of who we are. Um, you know, we have a great big one right here in, in, in Columbus, Columbus, Ohio. That part of connectionalism has been a big, big part of that. And I think the driving piece at the center of that for me has been the kind of the evangelical spirit that we inherited from our great, great, great grandpa, John Wesley, who, um, you know, who had that experience of his heart being strangely warm, that it was a life-changing experience and that he dedicated the rest of his life to making that happen. I think that's so much a part of our DNA even yet today. Um, um, and, and the ways that the change of the generations, uh, we recognize that that there's new and different ways to continue, but the primary message is there. I mean, you, you get that in your yeah. communication. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I see you do over and over and over again is um, use models and methods of communication that, that, that might be new and fresh and that we've not experienced before. But at the end of the day, you're telling the, the church's story and you're highlighting Jesus as a, as a, as a part of that. Yeah. So um, I'm just glad that I'm a part of this connection. I never feel like I'm alone. You know, right before we came over to have this conversation today, I was on the phone with a colleague that I haven't talked with in a couple of years. And it was like no time had passed. And we we, we were immediately in a conversation about our shared ministry together. Yeah. And that's just a part of, part of who we are. 
you know, a Wesleyan spirit, a Wesleyan theology has always made sense to me too. So I think I'm in the right place. Yeah. For sure, for sure. What about you? I mean, you're as a lay person in the yeah. church. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, to go to my experiences of that connection, right? And to be a part of the United Methodist Church, it is so beneficial to be a part of that, to know that you have hundreds of churches in your near community Mm -hmm. and thousands of churches in your far global community that are ultimately the part of the same family. So, um, you know, you're a young guy um, in the church and uh, one of our young adults, um, and uh, you're you're still hanging around the United Methodist Church. So do you you have any hopes for... I do. I really do. And I am not afraid of the the elephant in the room. And for me... I learned from my time serving um, with uh, Pastor Jason Wellman, and he taught me that when you serve in the church, the mission drives everything. That was such an important lesson because when I was learning how to lead a local church, Sayada Ridge had a mission. Mm -hmm. The mission was to seek unchurched people, to nurture disciples, and to ultimately partner with Jesus to transform the world. And so every decision we made, every struggle we had, everything that we did, every celebration that we had, ultimately related back to the mission. Yeah, I think I share, uh, you know, very much the same kind of hopes that that you do um, for the church. Uh, my hope for the United Methodist Church is that we would stay on mission. And I think the mission statement we've been operating out of for several years is still very, very, very valid. My hope for the United Methodist Church in what I'm seeing on the horizon is that that we will continue to grow into being more and more the church that engages in person's lives in such a way that they can experience Jesus, that they can hear the good news of Jesus, especially for folks for whom the church has not felt accessible, for those who um, have been considered outside, for those who have a life experience that they don't believe they would ever be valuable enough to be loved by Jesus, persons that have been hurt by the church. Mm You know, there are those of us who have easy access, and then there are those for whom the doors of the church don't look as open. For me, I hope that we might be able to frame our relationship with people who are not like ourselves or even like ourselves, that we would put the priority of people and the priority of persons having access to hearing the gospel and experiencing and living the gospel out would be a higher priority than positions that we might hold or right. those kinds of things o- over time. And, and I think that really is a part of, of what the United Methodist Church is like, mm-hmm. and even more so in our um, emerging. And you know, I'm just kind of celebrating that the numbers of people who will come and have the experience, Alex, that you and I have had, and that is the joy of being a Jesus follower yeah. um, in our lives and uh, being able to to um, have that experience as well. So. Well, um, you know, I, you know, just to just to close, um, you know, thank you for your investment in me. Uh, and, you know, ultimately saying yes to all those years ago to not realizing um, before I was even born what your and mom's choices and what your call to ministry looked like and what your future looked like ultimately would lay the groundwork uh, for mine. And, um, you know, I truly love what I do and I wouldn't wouldn't trade it for anything. So well, I, I, I want to um, I just, you know, I tell you this regularly, but um, and try to do it in public every once in a while. But I just uh, I want to remind you how incredibly proud of you I am and your mom. Uh, the two of us are all the time. We sit back and behind your back, we have conversations like, how did we get so blessed to have that boy and be able to call him ours? You continue to bring us such joy, and uh, we love watching what you're doing, and um, we like to boast, <laughs> and we're just really, really proud of the stuff, um, of the stuff that, that you do. One of the things that we decided early on when we were parenting is that we would raise you boys from a stewardship perspective. And what that means is that we understood that we didn't own you, but that God gave you to us to care for for a period of time and to allow you to grow and blossom and to be 
the people that God called you to be and live that out. And that was so many years ago, we began to think about what does that look like? And uh, now we get to see, we're beginning to see in amazing ways um, that dream, that dream come true. And it's happened through you. So love, love you, man. You. Love you, man. Love you. Beach to it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Times Like These. Episodes are available wherever you listen to podcasts. If this episode has touched and inspired you, please share it with a friend. If you know of someone we should feature on this program, please let us know by emailing us at wocmedia at wocumc.org. We'll see you next time.